All right, there we are. Cool, I think I'm gonna start. So, welcome and thank you for attending my talk. <coughs> my name is Helge. I'm with a company called Offersen. Uh, who has heard of Offersen? Quite a few people, um, to be expected at a conference like this. Um, but yeah, basically we are a online marketplace for people working in tech and anybody involved with uh, building the software, uh, software developers, designers, product managers, uh, as well as data scientists. Um, and we are a market marketplace for, for those peop people to, to find jobs and the companies that are uh, looking to hire them. So the title of the talk is a bit cryptic, but um, I'm gonna explain what everything is about just now. Uh, but first I'm gonna say something about uh, why we're giving this talk. <coughs> so this is uh, one of my favorite books, it's called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Who has read it? No one. <laughs> well, it's not a book about motorcycle maintenance. It's also not a book, really a book about uh, Zen philosophy. It's actually, uh, I think, a book about passion, about um, passion for your craft. Uh, and one of the takeaways from the book is that tools are really important, and I definitely second that. And I think that's a lot what Offersen is also about, is about the passion for, for software as a craft. So we don't <coughs> just help people find jobs. Uh, we also have uh, Offersen Source, which is a place where um, makers can publish articles and blog posts about what the thi things that excite them, and we also have something called Office and Make, which is more, more about learning cool things. I'll talk about more about that uh, later on. Mm. So just a little bit about myself. So my background is in applied maths and computer science. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Office and um, I've been doing data science for the last six years or so at companies like Mixit, Snapscan, um, and now at Offersen. And um, um, another reason for giving this talk is that uh, as a data scientist, I looked a lot at the numbers and we tried to understand the market. And I found that. In South Africa, there's about 100,000 people call, calling themselves software developers, but about 1,000 calling themselves data scientists. So from that, we deducted that, okay, maybe it would be a good idea if more software developers would actually get into data science and start doing things, and I think that's possible. So that's also a lot about what this talk is about. Um, at Office, then I'm part of the product team so uh, when we discuss building new features into the product, for instance, the uh, algorithm that recommends the right candidates for the right jobs and to the right companies, uh, we build that with data science uh, basically from the start. Um, there is a tendency for data scientists to um, operate in a sort of ivory tower, as we call it, where they are seen as just this bunch of you know, very educated people doing their own fancy math things uh, that nobody really understands. And I think that's, that's not really the way it should be. Um, cool. So another reason why I think maybe it's good if, if software developers do more data science. Uh, this is called the CRISP uh, DM model for da data mining. So it stands for something like the cross-industry um, standard for data mining process. And basically you start with understanding the business problem. Uh, then you need to understand the data and how it relates to that. Uh, how you prepare the data. How you clean it and all so forth. Um, then you need to think about how you model the data. Uh, and an important step is evaluation or uh, if 
your model is, is working the way you want it to, and if it's not, you have to start again and kind of, so the point is data science is a iterative uh, type of workflow. And developers have already ticking some of these boxes, I would say. So typically developers have a pretty good business understanding. Perhaps increasingly so as, as you know, uh, software is, is eating the world and actually developers are very important part of the companies where they work and they do more and more of the underlying business. Um, they typically understand the data very well because they route the code that usually generates the data. And of course, deployment is, 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 is something that uh, developers can do very, very well. So I'm gonna focus more on the other parts about preparing the data, modeling the data, and uh, evaluating it. Great. <coughs> so moving more towards the actual topic of this talk, it has to do with uh, scaling data science with Spark. Um, so because, like we saw in the previous slide, it is, it is an iterative process, we want to be able to iterate faster. So uh, if you have to wait, wait for days and weeks to get your results, that can really slow you down. Uh, to be uh, effective at, at data science, we want to be able to get our results uh, pretty rapidly, even if you have large data sets. Um, so you don't want to be in this situation where you uh, are practicing sword fights while you're waiting for your model to train. Um, and uh, that's where the technologies that I'm going to talk about today come in. Uh, so this is Spark, it's Apache Spark. Uh, what it is is a distributed uh, data processing pipeline or a platform rather, um, and it solves, to try and solve the problem of uh, doing analysis on, on, on big data sets, um, we need to turn to firstly parallelization, so we need to do computation in, in parallel, um, and if you do that, often your problem tends to become uh, uh, more bound by, by IL, and shifting a lot of data around. And to try and avoid that, we wanna do something called data locality where the computation that happens on the data happens on data that's local. Um, so that's what the Spark framework, uh, it's all about and it can read data from all sorts of different sources. Um, MySQL, Elasticsearch, Redis, MongoDB, Postgres, um, I'm gonna mostly focus on this one today, which is HGFS, that stands for the Hadoop Distributed Data uh, File System, uh, which I'm gonna explain more about. But I'm gonna try and do things a little bit interactive. Uh, and hopefully the demo gods will be with me if things go, don't go according to plan. I also do have a screencast. Mm. But what I'm gonna do, um, <coughs> I'm gonna use this tool that was in the title of the talk called Flint Rock. And what that tool does, it, it, it actually allows us to very easily create a Spark cluster of any number of machines um, kind of on the fly. But we'll see how that works just now. So. I'm just gonna run this command. Um, this is basically saying launch uh, a cluster called Linux Conf demo, and I'm gonna launch a cluster with three slaves. Um, so there's gonna be a, a four node cluster basically. Uh, I'm just gonna start that. Hopefully everything is going well. Okay, so what it's actually doing now it's gonna s launch this cluster and it's gonna do it on, on AWS in the cloud. Uh, I've actually got a, a view. So we should, um, 
with time start seeing uh, these instances start popping up. So there you can see there's four instances. So you have one master that is kind of the controlling the cluster. We have a master, and then we have then three slaves that are actually going to do the processing. Um, so <coughs> the Flintrock uh, is an open source tool that does all the logic around being able to, to start the cluster. And you can even scale it up and down. So if you find you're going to need 10 more nodes, you can just add 10 more nodes. And if that's too much, uh, you can take them away again. And you can e also easily destroy the, the whole cluster again. I know a reason that is nice is that it becomes more cost effective. So you don't have to need, need to have this cluster running all the time. You just fire it up when you need it. You can run a, a very large workflow on hundreds of thousands of nodes. And you can just shut it down again. And you don't pay for it when you're not, when you're not actually using it. Um, so th that is the whole idea behind it. <coughs> Here you can see it's starting to install different things, installing Java. It's doing this on all the nodes in parallel. Uh, it's installing HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. So let's go back to our slides. For a second. Okay, and just talk about the HDFS. So um, HDFS is a ma uh, master slave architecture where you have a name node. <coughs> so it, 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 it is very much like a regular file system. You have like a home folder and so on, except that your data is distributed across multiple machines or nodes. Uh, and you also have data replication. So it splits the files up in different blocks and it distributes that across the cluster. So you can have the same file uh, in different places um, and split into different blocks. And the reason that you, you do that is data redundancy. So you don't want, uh, if one of these machines um, disappear if and you have a long running, multi-hour job uh, running, you don't want one of your machines, the whole jobs to fail. Um, and that's why we have basically this data replication. So that's HDFS and this data is then stored on, on drive. So now it's uh, busy installing Spark. So Spark kind of sits on top of, on top of that. Uh, and it's very much a, a same, the same thing. Um, but it, it's got something called a RDD, which is a redundant distributed data frame which is very much the same idea as, as HDFS, where the data is distributed across nodes and um, replicated so that it's fault tolerant, but instead of sitting on a hard drive, it actually sits in memory, which, which um, means that, uh, well, computation will be m more high performance, right? Uh, so that's the RDDs. Installing Spark. Right, another important part of the Spark framework, uh, in addition to the data, is the computation. So that is done with uh, what is called MapReduce. So MapReduce is really it's an interface to do uh, computational uh, uh, computations in parallel. So if you can implement your program as a MapReduce program, um, that means it the Spark cluster can take it and uh, quite easily uh, ap apply computation in parallel. So the way that it works is that you have some data and um <coughs> you split that data into some 
um, paths, then you have the first task type of task is the mapping. That just takes a single input and outputs a single output. So in this case, it's just counting the words that is getting it as input. Uh, then you can have a, a shuffle operation, which um, this is basically like a key value type thing. So you'll have a key and then you have a value. Um, our task here is to count the frequency of, of words in this data. Um, and the shuffling will just group the um, the keys that are uh, the same together like this, and then you have the reducer, which will actually take multiple like data points like this and, for instance, count them. Uh, so, and in the end, we collect the results and we get okay. Hadoop was mentioned three times. Is was mentioned two times. Um, and that whole thing happened in, in parallel, and you can actually uh, do this in multiple stages uh, and repeat it, which is quite quite useful in many cases. So let's see. Okay, so our cluster is done. It took about six minutes to launch that. Um, that was a three-node cluster, but I've, I've tried this with ten and hundreds of, of nodes, and it actually takes the same amount of time. So that's pretty nice that you can launch a large cluster like that uh, in relatively little time. Uh, so now that we have that, you can, I mean, you can log in. So it uh <coughs> gives you just a shortcut to log into the cluster. It's going to log into the, the, um, the master node. And um, yeah, so this uh, these nodes are, are all um, based on the Amazon Linux AMI. And and yeah, there you have it. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, get the host name of this thing. So because every time you you start a cluster like that is on AWS is going to give you a different host name. Um, I'm just going to get that in here. Okay. <coughs> right. Uh, next, I'm just going to start some processes and things on the on the cluster. getting back to back to spark a little bit so uh, normally you don't we don't actually implement things directly in MapReduce like this there's a lot of tools that have been built on top of it that makes things a lot easier so one of them is spark SQL which implements these things called data frames so this is basically like uh, SQL um, on spark and you can run your normal queries, like group buys and filters and counts and all of those things. Uh, and it will actually translate that back into, into MapReduce and do all the things in parallel on the big data. Um, but to you, it's almost like working with a normal SQL table. So that's a very nice one. And the other one is if, if you're doing machine learning, there's a package called Spark ML that actually works on top of the data frames again, uh, doing machine learning type things. Again, everything has been implemented. Uh, you just you train models like you would do in uh, your typical machine learning libraries, uh, and it will translate that into into MapReduce, and that will kind of work. And Final piece of the puzzle are these things called Jupyter Notebooks. I'm going to show them uh, more interactively just now. But basically, this is like the data scientist's lab and lab equipment and experiments and everything in once. So um, this is what 
typically will use as the interface uh, when working with, with the data. Good. I just want to make a comment about this. So because this is actually, Jupyter is actually a web interface and it's running on the uh, Spark, basically master node. Um, and it's running on a local port there. So, so what I actually do is, um, but it's, it's running basically over a HTTP. So for security reason, you don't wanna just send your data uh, across HTTP, so I use like a, a SSH tunnel to that to that machine, uh, and that means it's basically available on my local host. Uh, should be uh, just like that. Uh, actually, I'm not <laughs> running it on my local host. Now it's running on the the cluster master node, right? Because it's tunneled. Okay, so this is actually the the uh, Jupyter Notebook interface. So you can do things like arithmetics. Um, okay, I think I need to start up first. But each of these is a cell. You write you write Python code. You write some code in the cell. If you run the cell, it executes. Uh, right now, it actually has to start the, the cluster, so that it takes a little bit of time. <coughs> um, but you can do inline plots. You can do, you can investigate your data, all sorts of things here. Um, so Spark has this concept of a Spark context, uh, which is just like that, and it just gives you the version of Spark you're running and <coughs> also the location of your, your master node. This next query I'm just running, so we had three slaves, so I'm just doing a, like a parallel operation on all um, those slaves. Um, and it's actually gonna go and uh, distribute that computation to it in this case is three, but it could be hundreds, right? And it just I'm just showing here that each of them have a different IP address. Uh, that's all, that's these, basically these three guys. So that, that was a parallel computation there. Um. Good. Is there any questions maybe at this point <laughs> or <laughs> before we continue? All right, so once we have the cluster running, we, we want to do something useful with it, right? So what we're going to do is to tackle uh, this problem of re rec recommendations. So what we want to do, uh, a customer has who bought this item also bought other items type of type of thing. Uh, so just to bring things back to office in a little bit, um, we want to recommend the right candidates to companies. So if you're a company on office and uh, looking to hire and you've maybe um, s interacted with a few other candidates, we want to recommend you know other candidates that might be similar to that one uh, to you. Another example is, is maybe take a lot. So you're busy shopping on take a lot and you're looking to buy this laptop. Um, then maybe a good recommendation would be all sorts of laptop accessories or a laptop bag. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk about a sort of classic algorithm in this sense. It's called association rule mining. And what it really does is, so you have X, which could, for example, be a laptop, and you have Z, which could be a laptop bag. And the first thing is you do is to calculate the, the support for this transaction, which is just the probability that <laughs> these two uh, 
uh, occur together, right? And then we put a threshold on that. So we're saying these two have to occur frequently together. So if somebody, you can imagine if somebody randomly bought a laptop and uh, you know, a bottle of shampoo, then you don't want to recommend the shampoo because it was just sort of a once-off thing. But if people buy laptops and laptop bags together a lot, then maybe it's, it's more of a good recommendation. Um. Other thing is a confidence type uh, thing, which is a technically, we call that a conditional probability. So it is the given that somebody bought a laptop bag, laptop, what is the probability that they bought a, bought a laptop bag? Um, and that could be different. So um, you might find that that value could be very high, but the other way around could be lower. So if somebody bought a laptop bag, you know, it's not like uh, you say, hey, I know I bought this laptop bag. Maybe I need a nice laptop to go with that. Uh, so, so, so the direction also matters, right? So this is basically the algorithm. Just an example, so if um, you have this data set and you calculate then um, different transaction IDs, so you calculate the, the support, which is the probability that both of A and C in this case occur, that's 50% because they occur in half across this trend of the set, uh, so and then the uh, confidence is, is higher because that's the conditional probability. So given that you have A, how often do you see C? So that's two basically out of three. So that's then 66%, right? Um. So you can say that, okay, these occur quite frequently together and um, uh, the rule CA is, is actually much more frequent, so maybe this would be a better recommendation. So I'm gonna uh, just run that. So uh, I've already loaded the data. That's what I had with my script previously did. Um, actually put the data on, on HDFS. So the data is sitting there, so I'm just going to read it in. Okay, so the data I got here, it's from, actually from open source projects. So it's a publicly available data set that has tags attached to open source projects. So if, if if you had a, a project that was written in C, the tag would be C. If you had a project uh, written in Java, the ja tag would be Java. If it's a Linux program, the tag would be Linux. So what we're trying to, f to do here is to mine this data and find which tags frequently occur together and try and generate uh, rules, rules from that. I'm just gonna run all the things. <coughs> So this is basically how it looks like. There's an ID, which is the project ID. And there's a bunch of tags, which could be you know, GPL, multimedia, or uh, seeing graphics, so on. And licensing is often there, GPL, and so on. Uh, so we have about 46,000 projects here. I'm going to use an algorithm called FP growth, which is a uh, details that aren't very important. It's, it's a tree-based algorithm that goes and finds um, uh, basically these frequent item sets and the associated rules. Uh, and I set a minimum support, so I'm saying at least, if this is interesting to me, at least 10% of the data points must have the, the, the item set and I must have at least a minimum confidence of 50% uh, in this rule for it, it to be reported. Uh, so I found, in this case, 27 such uh, 
frequent item sets because we set actually the the um, the threshold quite high but some of which it's found is just like linux and gpl which kind of makes sense web and internet um yeah c and gpl and so on so that seems reasonable uh, and um, so these are actually predictions, and then once you have that, you can start to use this to make predictions. So uh, in this case, there was C and LGPL and a few things, and they predicted, okay, maybe GPL should also be a tag. So that you can use when you, when you are making the recommendations, and if somebody has already put the laptop in and in their basket at take a lot then you can make a prediction hey uh, this person might also want to buy a laptop bag and then you present that then to the user okay and that all happened now on the spark cluster that we created it happened in in parallel uh, which could scale to hundreds of thousands and, and very, very large data set, although this example was obviously uh, rather small. I'm just gonna, how we can maybe talk about it. Um, All right, so so uh, I think I'm going to take some questions now, but yeah, to to con conclude things, um, this is really a nice nice way to maybe I can just so once you're done, you can um, you can easily destroy your uh, your cluster. You just run. Destroy that, and it should. Uh, it's gonna say yes. Are you sure? Sure. Okay, and it's gonna take it away, and it's not gonna cost you anything anymore. Okay, so this is quite a nice, nice workflow to be able to just fire up cluster of any size, do whatever you need to do, and bring it down again. And you only pay for that specific time that you that you spend. So that's what I, I wanted to show you. <laughs> uh, maybe we can take some questions if there are any. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. So you might be able okay. To now I just wanted to find out. I see that uh, obviously you're using Amazon Cloud there. Um, have you tried deploying this in a private uh, HPC type environment? Uh, I've I've tried not using you not not using this tool though. So this tool is specifically for uh, for Amazon Cloud. Yeah. Okay, so it is um, Amazon specific. Yeah, it, this particular one is that's that's what it does. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I haven't found any tools that are as nice to if you want to dis deploy your your own cluster. But I've done those. I mean, you can do all of these steps steps manually. Um, usually when you, do, I mean, if you have bought your own hardware, you, uh, I mean, you will set it up once and you just leave it running because it doesn't cost you anything <laughs> really to keep it running. I think Amazon is, is different in the sense that it's, you actually pay for the usage, so, and you don't use it most of the time, just when you want to run a big query across all your data. So that's yeah, why it's, it's useful here to have something convenient to bring it up and down. Okay. Yeah. No. It's just uh, so in our environment. Uh, I'm in the university environment, and the result is that we often have, like recently, I can cite one of our recent examples where our zoology department we're doing um, 
comparative analysis on the genome structures of pests, insects, call them what you want. Uh, the result is that they, they ultimately needed an elastic type platform where they could expand out and do what they needed to do. I, I had to give them a, a, a minimum amount of processing power and allow them to burst into some of the uh, our other resources, but at the end of the day, to be able to allow them to do exactly what you're doing here, but in a closed environment. Um, I mean, it's very interesting, and uh, it's definitely something that we could use, but cool. the yeah. limitation is obviously, is, you know, uh, when it comes to researchers, unfortunately, uh, yeah, they, they, they trust Amazon up to a point, uh, and then management steps in, and suddenly Amazon isn't trusted anymore. And okay. uh, some of the data sets that we work with, uh, one of the problems we sit with is the Poppy Act. And as soon as we want to dump raw data onto Amazon, we get told, sorry, you're not allowed to do that because, you know, they're, they're sensitive information. Okay, so I've actually, we actually also looked into Poppy and GDPR and those type of things. And I've, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a different topic, but I, I've also con consulted uh, uh, attorneys about that. and. And their interpretation of the law is that uh, you need to host your data in a location that has as strict or stricter laws than, than Poppy. So you'll see um, uh, we, have we are hosting in, in Ireland, which is a e European Union member, and they are subject to GDPR, which is even actually even stricter than Poppy. And the interpretation of the, the Poppy Act is that that is okay because because of that reason. But yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. There's one over there. So why do you think uh, uh, Google moved away from MapReduce? Google. Yes. Uh, um, honestly, I'm not aware they have. <laughs> in two, in like in 2014, so they moved their. Uh, like their yeah, platform from the Hadoop map reduce. Yeah. Yeah. To. So now it's more based on the Spark framework and all that. Sorry. It's based more on the Spark framework. Yeah, Spark uses map reduce and the line. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Are you? Yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, you are obviously using AWS and Spark. Can you comment on your preference of AWS versus Google Cloud or uh, Azure? Um, so, yeah. Uh, AWS, I think, is maybe a more open platform. So, <laughs> to some extent, it's preferred more with. Um, people in open source and it's been around longer, uh, so people know it. The Google Cloud is a lot newer. Uh, Google Cloud has a lot of um, built-in tools for doing data science and machine learning that are maybe a step ahead of, ahead of what Amazon has. So, uh, for instance, you have like Google AutoML, which is very easy to integrate if you're building, say, cell phone apps that photos of things and recognizes what is in the photos and that type of type of things. Uh, I think their interface is obviously uh, uh, also easier to use. <laughs> so it depends on uh, yeah, <laughs> how technically skilled you are. But yeah, that I would definitely say AWS is more flexible and also a little bit more uh, affordable. Um, yeah, but I don't really have specific preference one, o one way or the other. They, they both kind of do the same. I just say, in my experience, AWS is a bit more uh, flexible and easier to script and make it do whatever you want it to do. Yeah. That's, that's about it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much.